Last week, uh, we began to read the body of this letter that Paul wrote to the church uh, at Philippi. We'll be reading today, again, from the first chapter. Uh, If you haven't uh, turned there, if you have your Bible, please do turn there to chapter 1. We'll be reading from that momentarily. It is one of the most personal of all of Paul's letters, this book of Philippians. And we can understand why, because only a decade earlier had God used Paul and others that were traveling with him to plant this church in the city. You'll remember that it's the first church it was planted that we have recorded in the scripture on the continent of Europe. It was in Macedonia, which is in northern Greece, that a seed was planted a couple thousand years ago and the gospel advanced. We have many details of what happened in Philippi 10 or 12 years earlier, preserved for us in Acts chapter 16. You'll remember Lydia, a slave girl, a Roman jailer, and now... Ten years later, no doubt others who God had saved and transformed by the gospel of his son. Perhaps some could share a dramatic transformation that are here today, like the Roman jailer who withstood an earthquake, or like Paul himself who saw that great light in Christ on the road to Damascus. Quite dramatic. But maybe, though, there were others that God added to the church and even your experience whose testimony might be more like Lydia's, simple and quiet, God opening up her heart. Well, now in prison, Paul remembers his brothers and sisters in Christ and he thanks them for their partnership in the gospel. He prays for their growth in the faith that their love for Christ and each other would abound more and more. So today we turn to chapter 1 and I'm going to go back and begin with verse 12 though we will be focusing on the last section that I'll read. If you have your Bible and you're able to stand this morning, stand with me as we begin Philippians 1, chapter 12 through, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 12 through 26. Paul says this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known that throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether it is in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now As always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain 
and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Praise God for his word, and may he bless this reading uh, to us today. You may be seated. I read all of that, a little longer section this morning, together because if we look at it as those verses, that section together, we see an outline. We talked about this a little bit last week, but in verse 12, I'll remind you that Paul looks back to all that got him here and landed him here in jail in Rome. In verses 13 through 18, Paul relates his present situation. And now in our passage today in 19 through 26, Paul looks joyfully to the future. So you get in this section, of course, his past, his present, and his future. All that has happened to me, all of my past sufferings, the difficulties, he includes them all. Even my imprisonment has been, in verse 13, for Christ. This would, I'm sure, make the Philippians recall being imprisoned, uh, Paul being in prison with Silas 10 years earlier when they came and planted that seed. Now at the present time, in verse 16, Paul writes, I am put here again, again, once again, in prison for the defense of the gospel. So Paul goes through his life being in prison. These are the things that had happened to him. These are the things that are happening to him. And things will ultimately transpire that Paul will be martyred because of these things. Because he says in verse 13, they are for Christ. And in verse 16, they are for the gospel. Now from 19 to 26, Paul looks forward. He looks ahead. And as he faces the future, note the grace and the confidence with which he writes. He says, yes, and I will rejoice. He's rejoicing now in the present as we read at the end of chapter 18. He says, now I rejoice. I rejoice. Christ is proclaimed. I rejoice. That's present tense language. But now he looks ahead and he says, yes, and I will rejoice. I'm rejoicing now, but the rejoicing is not over. I will continue to rejoice. Confident, hopeful, eagerly expecting what will transpire in the future. Whatever the details are. Paul doesn't look back. We know, because of other writings, what Paul went through. But Paul doesn't take the time in this letter to this this church that he loves so much, this little church at Philippi, he doesn't take the time to look back and rehash all the things that he's gone through, all the sufferings. He is simply straightforward saying, here I am in prison and I'm rejoicing and I will continue to rejoice He didn't go into personal details in verse 12. Paul intends to encourage the Philippians by saying, whatever has happened to me has had a divine purpose, a divine trajectory in my life that has landed me here for the purpose of advancing the gospel. This was Paul's great obsession, that Christ would be proclaimed, that the gospel would would be advanced. What a great duo of things for us to consider. Is that our heart really this morning? Is that why we live this morning as believers? Is that why we truly find our main existence? That Christ would be proclaimed. That the gospel would be advanced. 
So how was this happening? Well, it was happening through evangelism. We just read that Paul was imprisoned and chained to the imperial guard. These are the bodyguards for the emperor. Only God could orchestrate such circumstances. He put Paul there. That's what Paul said. I am put here. Who do you think put him there? God put him there to do a job of evangelizing to them, of telling them about the gospel. This was a group that perhaps the only other, the only way he could have audience with them is to be chained to them. And God divinely purposed that that precisely would be the case. They, as I said last week, would have, I mean, nine or 10,000 men over all of the empire, all having the ear of the emperor. Think of the influence that God has placed in Paul's life for him to be. Through giving not just evangelism to the lost, he also is giving encouragement to the church, to his brothers that are in Rome. They were being encouraged, we read last week and this morning, to say, hey, if Paul is in prison and he can't do it, then we will pick up where he left off and we'll go on and do the job. We will do it if Paul is unable to be out here in Rome with us. The situation was not all easy and pleasant, though. It wasn't the evangelizing the lost that was hard. It was the troubles arising from other believers that was so difficult. Many times, our greatest hurts don't come from unbelievers, but come from other Christians. Yet again, Paul doesn't go into details of how and why he was mistreated by them. He simply says, they do it to afflict me. Nothing else. What grace he shows. I'm not the focus, Paul says. The focus is Christ and his gospel. And in that, I will rejoice. Paul speaks plainly and directly now to the Philippians in our passage today. He says, For I know that through your prayers and the help or the supply of the Spirit, we or it will turn out for my deliverance. Perhaps uh, the more used word in deliverance is actually salvation. It's the very word that, that Paul uses elsewhere for just that, salvation. Paul knows that all this will turn out that he ultimately will be saved because he doesn't know if he'll be delivered from prison or if he'll die there. It hasn't been determined as far as Paul knows and understands. So here, Paul brings the human asking for their prayers, and the divine asking for the supply of the Spirit together. Your prayers and the, and the supply of the Spirit will turn out or will result in my salvation. Paul is confident that he will be saved from this situation. Deliverance will come one way or another. I mean, what a real solid, simple look at life. One way or another, if you've been touched by the Lord this morning, if you've responded to the grace that's offered to you this morning, if you are a believer because God started a work in you, the good news is there's no uncertainty about what will be or what won't be. The details, really, they don't matter. That's why Paul would say, to live is Christ. To die is gain. He is certain, as he says, I know, in verse 19. I know I will be delivered. It's my eager expectation. It's my hope. When we read of hope in the New Testament, it's not a wishful way of thinking. Oh, I just wish 
that this would happen. That's not what biblical theological hope truly is. It is a confident certainty. It is knowing. It is verse 6 again. It is understanding and believing that God who started this good work in me will bring it to completion. That's hope. Not a wish, but a true conviction. Whether by life or by death, he says, I know the things will work out, but I just don't know how the details are going to come together. We have that same hope this morning if we've trusted in Christ. We don't know what the details of our lives are going to be. We don't know what today is going to bring. We don't know if tomorrow will even happen for us. But we can be confident. We can be hopeful that our hope is placed in a God who promises and delivers on his promise. This is Christian hope. It's biblical hope. It's not a wish, but it's an eager expectation. Paul doesn't know the details, but he knows that every detail in his experience as one commentator said, is but another of the Father's finishing touches as God brings to the completion the good work that he starts. This is a sure faith for Paul and for us too. The true believer never needs to fear the outcome of the events of his life, for we know that God is working all things together for our good. God will complete his work. That is what we might call the ends. Yet Paul is aware of the means by which these ends will happen. And he says, your prayers and the supply of the Spirit, he puts them together. Right together, Paul recognizes his weaknesses and his own needs because he's asking the Philippians to pray for him. He needs their prayers. And it is our responsibility today to one another, to pray for one another. We depend on that. We live by that. He needs their joyful prayers, but he also needs the help and supply of the Spirit. Paul knows his duty. He knows what his responsibilities are. And he says like this, he says, I will not be ashamed. I will not be put to shame. But that with full courage, now as always, what a phrase, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul's saying that whether I live or die, it really doesn't matter what Paul is saying. Either way, Christ will be honored. He will be exalted. The word there is really he will be magnified. He will be enlarged in me. That's the Greek word. That's the meaning. That Christ would be enlarged. Megalino. He would be enlarged within my body, within my life. Everything that makes up who I am. Now, as always, Paul said, what, a, what an expectation of himself. Paul had a duty. He wasn't perfect, but he found his confidence in God's gracious help and the prayers of God's gracious people. That God would indeed supply his need, every need, according to his riches and glory. And in addition to that, that the people would pray for him. With your prayers and the endless supply of the Spirit of Christ... Now, as always, this is my earnest expectation, my hope that whether I live or die, Christ will be magnified in my body, in me. And that means in everything that makes up my life, my conduct, my pursuits, my relationships, my attitudes, my thinking, my speaking, my acting, my worship. In life or in death, let Christ be magnified. I must decrease. He must increase. Man, I'm convicted. Are you convicted this morning 
Do you ask the question to yourself like I've asked that question to myself all week long? Is this the pattern of my life? Is this my way of living? Is it the pattern of my home and of my marriage, of my parenting my kids at my work? Does this define who I am, the proclamation of Christ and his gospel? Paul concludes that for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Seth read earlier from chapter 3 this morning in the book of Philippians. And I had him do that because there Paul recounts his life. He does look back and he said, whatever gain, did you get that? Whatever gain I had, I counted. I counted that gain for loss for the sake of Christ. In that passage, Paul was remembering the day when Christ became everything to him. He counted the cost. And Paul found Christ to be worth More than all those other things. All those personal accomplishments and accolades that he could collect. I counted those but loss, he said. Now in our passage this morning, Paul is still counting. He's still thinking about the change and transformation that the Lord had made in his life. And he's still finding Christ to be worthy of his expectations and every hope that he had. Paul himself is making progress in the faith by abandoning now, as always, everything for the sake and for the honor of Christ. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul is defining his life as gaining Christ and defining his death as the ultimate gain of Christ. Another commentator said, life means Christ to me as I grow in my knowledge and love for him. And death will mean Christ to me when I will depart and be with him. So Paul says, how can I possibly choose? Which way would I go if I had my choice? He said, the benefits are bo- of both are glorious. I'm hard-pressed between the two. The truth is the same for us today. Because the truth is, either we will live today or we will die today. That's the only two alternatives we have. There's nothing in between. We're either going to live or we're going to die. There's no other option. Paul says to live is Christ. To live means fruitful labor for me to do for Christ. To live is necessary and it's needful for you, my Philippian brothers and sisters. For you. But to die, well, to die is gain. It continues to be gain. It is to depart and be with Christ. It is, Paul said, far better. How do I choose between far better and more need- needful? What an abounding love for God and neighbor Paul displays here. What a godly indecision he speaks of. Here we see the true nature of a Christian's death. You know, our life here is just transitory, isn't it? Paul will will later tell us that we're pilgrims and strangers in this world, but we're citizens in another world. Paul knew something about transitory work because he was a tent maker by trade, right? Tents are temporary. They're movable. They're anything but permanent. Rather, to be exchanged, though someday, for a house that's not made with hands. A building that's from God that is eternal in heaven, Paul writes to the Corinthians. Death is far better. Imagine that. Death is far better because our home is with Christ. Our citizenship is there with him. We get to be with him. 
unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ, he lives. Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. There we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed. And we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. We're not saying that we don't mourn death here. Many of you may have lost friends and family in your lives. Fathers, maybe even your own mother. We will discover in chapter 2 that Paul nearly lost a friend as well to illness. And Paul thanks God for God's mercy in keeping his friend alive. Lest, Paul says, I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Paul is not just living on another level that we are. I mean, death here is something we weep after. Jesus stood one time at a graveside of a friend and he wept. For believers, though, weeping and rejoicing go together. They are friends. There is weeping in a Christian's death. But there is also rejoicing in the confidence that the believer is with the Lord. And that truly is far better. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The alternative to death for Paul carries with it a wonderful motivation, however. Remaining and continuing with his beloved Philippian brothers and sisters, his par partners in the gospel. And that means he will be for their progress. That's what he says. I'm going to be here. I just know this is how the Lord will use me. I will be here, but my motive is your progress. I want to be fruitful with it. And I want to see that labor come to fruit. I want to see you Progress. It's the same Greek word as is in verse 12 used in advance. To advance the gospel, to progress in the faith. His desire in life is fruitful labor. And for now, it seems more necessary that he lives to help them advance in joy and advance in their faith. So that ultimately, they will glory in Christ Jesus they will rejoice too. What Paul had said he was doing at the beginning of the passage, they are doing at the end of the passage. Paul uses those three words. The reason that I am rejoicing is on your account. And on their account, he says, I will remain. I will continue. I will live for Christ. Whether in life or death, Paul finds his joy and glorying in Christ alone. In a moment, we'll sing what is our hope in life and death. Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to him belong? Who holds our days in his hand? What comes apart from his command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. For Paul, the past is for Christ. For Paul, the present is for the gospel. I'm put here for the gospel. For Paul, the future, whether it's with Christ or whether it's with you, my Philippian brothers and sisters in Christ, for your progress, for your advancement, for your joy in the faith, for your glorying or rejoicing in Christ Jesus. Doesn't that make you, this morning, want to know him more? Want to love him more? Want to praise him more? That together we can sing, oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and in death. Let's stand together.